Hello everyone. Today we're continuing our deep dive of Richard Dawkins and Yan Wong's book, The Ancestor's Tale. In this episode we're going to discuss plate tectonics and biogeography, so let's jump right in. We're leaving Boreo Eutheria today and making contact with the other two superorders of placental mammals, Aphrotheria, which evolved in Africa, and Xenarthra, which evolved in South America. Our last common ancestor with these clades lived about 90 million years ago in the Tyronean Epoch of the Late Cretaceous. According to one hypothesis, the first split of placental mammals consists of Boreo Eutheria and a clade called Atlantogenata, wherein Aphrotheria and Xenarthra are each other's closest relatives. The name of Atlantogenata refers to the fact that the two respective continents where Aphrotheres and Xenarthrans originated are separated by the Atlantic Ocean. Now we should pause to explain that this hypothesis is contested. Remember that morphological analyses left placental mammals unresolved as a giant polytomy, where lots of lineages branch from a single node in a cladistic analysis. But in truth, while molecular studies have resolved many relationships, there still remain a few nodes that are, as of yet, unresolved. While there is extremely good support for each clade, Aphrotheria, Xenarthra, and Boreo Eutheria, their interrelationships are highly disputed. Molecular studies have found support for Xenarthra being sister to all other placental mammals, Aphrotheria being sister to all other placental mammals, and Xenarthra and Aphrotheria being sister to Boreo Eutheria. The first edition of the Ancestor's Tale actually followed the Aphrotheria root hypothesis. Some researchers have gone so far as to claim this phylogeny is impossible to resolve in that these three lineages diverge from the common ancestor, essentially such that there are no two lineages that are more closely related to each other than there are to a third. However, a team of researchers in 2016 performed a phylogenetic analysis using 14,631 coding and non-coding genes from 36 taxa as well as 239 pre-microRNAs from 39 taxa. They also reanalyzed three analyses that obtained results incongruent to their own, and evaluated a morphological data set that utilized 4,541 characters. The researchers found that incomplete lineage sorting is rampant among these clades due to a rapid evolutionary radiation, obscuring the true phylogenetic signal. See our video, The Bonobo's Tale, for a discussion of this process. Despite this, the researchers did find support for the Atlanta Genata hypothesis, over both Xenarthra root and Aphrotheria root. We'll explore the implication of these two sharing one common ancestor later. Due to incomplete lineage sorting, there aren't very many genetic markers that strongly tie these clades together. There are, for example, a few retrotransposons that unite Xenarthra and Aphrotheria, such as L1MB5, but there are other retro elements that argue for the other hypotheses. There also aren't really any morphological characters that unite these clades. However, there is strong genetic evidence for the monophyly of both Xenarthra and Aphrotheria. We'll stick with the Aphrotheres for now, since the tale goes to the Xenarthrans. Aphrotheria is split into two major clades, with six total orders. The first clade is Aphroinsectophilia, which includes the following orders. Tubula dentata, the aardvark, Macrocelida, the elephant shrews, and Aphrosaurisida, the golden moles, otter shrews, and tenrex. The second clade is called Panungulata, which includes Hyracordia, the Hyraxes, Serenia, the Manatees and Dugong, and finally Probacidia, the Elephants. This has not always been the case though, as researchers previously grouped golden moles, elephant shrews, and tenrex among the insectivores based on dietary grounds. Molecular studies strongly contradicted this placement, and one paper notes that the monophyly of Aphrotheria is supported by, quote, indels, signs, protein sequence signatures, chromosomal sentinels, and nuclear and mitochondrial DNA sequences." Close quote. There are even a few potential morphological synapomorphies, such as lumbar vertebral number, cranial soft tissue features, aspects of placentation, and contact between the navicular and calcineus. However, within Aphrotheria, there has been substantial debate. For example, it has been debated whether elephants are more closely related to hyraxes or manatees. Recent molecular studies favor a manatees plus elephants clade. 
Now, crown Afrotheria appears to have originated in the late Cretaceous, according to molecular clocks, but the oldest known Afrotheria fossil is Osapea, from the middle Paleocene, about 59 million years ago, of Morocco. Its dental characters place it as either a stem member of Afroinsectophilia or stem Afrotheria. Either way, it's a really basal member of the superorder. From there, things get complicated. The aardvark has switched between both Afrotheria clades, but recent molecular studies have pinned it as the most basally derived member of Afroinsectophilia. There is one extant species of aardvark, Arcticopus affair, which is nocturnal and feeds predominantly on ants. This behavior formerly earned it a spot in the now defunct clade Edentata, which means toothless ones, despite the fact that the aardvark does have teeth. Pangolins and Xenarthrans were in this clade too, but molecular studies have broken it up. The earliest members of the aardvark family date to the Miocene just 20 million years ago, such as Maya Richteropus. Richteropus also previously extended as far west as India, but is now solely restricted to Africa. Remember from the Eye Eyes tale that the Madagascan Plesiorecteropus was thought to be an aardvark relative, but paleoproteomic data revealed it to be a tenrec relative instead. Additionally, a clade of stem aardvarks called Ptolemaida have been discovered, which lived in northern and eastern Africa from the latest Eocene to the Miocene. One last trivia, the name aardvark was originally used by Dutch colonists, and it essentially translates to earth pig. Next, elephant shrews, or sengi, are small insectivorous mammals named for their long nose. Ironically, elephant shrews are more closely related to elephants than shrews. They are diurnal and form monogamous pairs that guard territories. Their fossil record is much more extensive than that of the aardvark. Stem elephant shrews can be found back as far as the early Eocene, such as Chambius. Fossil elephant shrews evolved into tenrec forms, such as Myohyrax, and rodent-like forms, such as Mylomygale. And the earliest crown elephant shrews appeared in the Miocene. Golden moles are insectivorous burrowing mammals native to sub-Saharan Africa. They are mostly blind, having evolved a niche similar to the true moles and marsupial moles. However, some golden moles forage above ground, like Chrysospallax, and others swim through the sands of the Namib Desert, like Eremitalpa. Only a handful of golden mole fossils have been discovered, with the oldest, Proclysochlorus, coming from the Miocene of Kenya. We covered ten wrecks in the Eye Eye's Tale, so see that video for more information on them. Now we turn to Panungulata. Evidently, there were two rapid radiations in Afrothere history, one at the origin of the clade, and one in Panungulata, the Hyraxes, manatees, and elephants. First, we meet the Hyraxes, who are restricted to Africa and the Middle East. Hyraxes are small herbivores, with dentition similar to rodents. Just like rodents, the two upper incisors of Hyraxes grow continuously, and the canines have been lost. The four lower incisors form a comb. Hyraxes also have complex, multi-chambered stomachs like ruminants, and while they may chew on plant matter for a long time, they are physically incapable of regurgitation, so they aren't technically chewing cud. Their fossil record extends to the early Eocene with Sagurius in Africa. Hyraxes filled the role of grazer until ungulates reached the continent, displacing the Hyraxes to more marginal ecological roles. Interestingly, while elephants and obviously manatees are known to have aquatic ancestors, it turns out that the myoglobin of hyraxes are highly charged, which is an adaptation for aquatic animals to store enough oxygen for every dive before they need to take another breath. This indicates that the common ancestor of elephants, manatees, and hyraxes was closely tied to water. While elephants and hyraxes made their way back onto land, as for the manatees and dugong, they became fully aquatic. They are grazers eating seagrass found in coasts, estuaries, rivers, and swamps throughout the world. The first Sirenians in the fossil record come from the Middle Eocene of Jamaica, called Prorostomus and Pezosiren. Unlike our modern Sirenians, though, they had walking legs, and as we saw in Splitting Kinds, early Sirenians and early elephants, like Marotherium, had about the same walking capabilities. The major difference between them at that time was that the Sirenians preferred marine plants, while elephants preferred freshwater plants. Halotherium lived from 37 to 28 million years ago, late Eocene to early Oligocene, and retained reduced hind limbs and a reduced pelvis. This fossil was known even to Darwin, who included it as an example of a transitional fossil in a later edition of Origin of Species. 
From 3.6 million years ago until the mid-1700s lived the largest known genus of Cyrenian, Hydrodomalus, which reached up to 30 feet or 9 meters long. Sadly, it was hunted to extinction just 27 years after its discovery. The final extant group of Afrothairs is the order Probacidia, the elephants and their relatives. We did a whole video on elephant evolution four years ago, but in case you missed it, we'll give you the highlights. Elephants are large herbivorous mammals found today in Africa, India, and Southeast Asia. There are three extant species, the African savanna elephant, Loxodonta africana, the African bush elephant, Loxodonta cyclotus, and the Asian elephant, Elephas maximus. The elephant's most obvious feature is their trunk, which is a massively elongated and flexible nose. Elephants can use their trunk both to lift heavy objects, being used in India and Thailand for that exact purpose, and pick dainty flowers. The elephant's tusks are elongated upper canines, but this hasn't been the case for all elephants. The downward curving tusks of Dinotherium were lower canines, and Stegotetrabelodon had four tusks, both its upper and lower canines. Phosphatherium and Daouatherium are the oldest known elephants from the earliest Eocene of Morocco. Dinotheres, which first appeared in the late Oligocene, were the first proboscideans out of Africa, and the modern Elephantiformes are descended from the paraphyletic Paleomastodontida. Elephantiformes includes mastodons, gomphotheres, stegodons, mammoths, and the modern elephant species. Elephantiformes have been found on all continents except Australia and Antarctica. At least one species of gomphothere, Cuvieronius, reached South America following the formation of the Isthmus of Panama. More on that in a bit. There is another totally extinct clade of Afrotheres called Embrithopoda, exemplified by the bizarre rhino-like Arsinoetherium that lived from 36 to 27 million years ago, the late Eocene to early Oligocene. The earliest member of this clade is Stylolophus from the earliest Eocene. Some researchers have argued that embrithopods should be moved to the odd-toed ungulates instead, but more recent analyses have rebutted this association, keeping the embrithopods firmly among the Afrotheres. However, Phenacolophus and Desmostylia were previously considered Afrotheres, and both have been moved to the odd-toed ungulates. Now with all the Afrotheres covered, we turn our attention to the other side of the Atlantic, the Xenarthrans, the anteaters, armadillos, and the mammals for which this tale exists, the sloths. Before we meet the sloths, though, let's talk about plate tectonics. In 1912, German meteorologist Alfred Wegener first proposed his idea of continental drift. Wegener argued that the continents move around, and this explained both the shapes of Africa and South America, as well as the distribution of fossil plants and animals across the continents. For example, fossils of the Therapsid Cynognathus and the Anapsid Mesosaurus can be found on both South America and Africa, and fossils of the extremely abundant Therapsid Lystrosaurus and the Fern Glossopterus can be found on South America, Africa, India, and Antarctica. Glossopterus has been found in Australia, too. This suggested to Wegener that all the southern continents were joined together in the past, and he named this supercontinent Pangaea. However, most geologists at the time were unconvinced. There was no evidence that continents plowed along through the ocean crust, and geologists were typically satisfied by invoking falling sea levels to explain organismal distributions. The fit of South America and Africa was just a coincidence. So Wegener's hypothesis was discarded until the 1960s when it experienced a sudden resurgence. The discovery of mirror image paleomagnetic reversals on both sides of mid-ocean ridges made the case for the new and improved theory of plate tectonics. This requires a bit of explanation. Plate tectonics states that the Earth's crust and part of its upper mantle, collectively called the lithosphere, are broken into several plates, and these plates sit atop the asthenosphere, which is also part of the upper mantle. There are two types of crust, continental and oceanic. Continental crust is less dense, but thicker, than oceanic crust. But how do the continents actually move? Plates make contact with each other at boundaries, and there are three types. Convergent, transform, and divergent. Convergent boundaries are when two plates slide towards each other, and one plate is forced under another, called subduction. When organisms die and are fossilized, their fossils end up being part of a geological stratum, and this stratum can be carried upwards by a less dense plate gradually overtaking a denser plate. This is how fossils of aquatic organisms end up on mountains, not because of some mythical global flood. Second, transform boundaries are when two plates slide past each other. 
the Californian San Andreas Fault is one of the most famous examples of this, even getting its own action flick. But importantly, new oceanic crust is formed at divergent boundaries. Instead of the continents plowing across the oceanic crust, think of the oceanic crust being more like a conveyor belt. New oceanic crust is made as magma flows from the boundary, which is why oceanic crust is largely made of basalts, gabbro, and ultramafic rocks. One of the most well-known divergent boundaries is the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, first detailed by Marie Tharp and Bruce Heason. See Neil Shubin's book, The Universe Within, for a thorough look at their story. After making maps of the seafloor, researchers began analyzing seafloor samples to get an understanding of how old they are. Marvelously, researchers found that the oceanic crust on one side of the ridge is equally old as the identical section on the opposite side. As we approach the ridge from the continents, the rocks get steadily younger. What's more, these mirror sections are identical in the orientation of metals, like iron, towards the North Pole. This is because the Earth's magnetic North and South Poles move, and when a rock with metals cools, those metals point towards the North Pole. Looking at the sections, we can see that the orientation of the poles has flipped many times, called paleomagnetic reversals. Decreasing ages for rocks approaching the divergent boundary and mirror images of rock ages and paleomagnetism on both sides of the boundary have solidified the case for plate tectonics. The fact of plate tectonics explains geographic distributions of organisms, a field called biogeography. Why do oceanic islands 300 miles or more from the continental mainland lack indigenous terrestrial mammals, reptiles, and amphibians? Because there is virtually no way for these animals to have reached those islands before humans transported them. Oceanic islands often have birds, bats, and various insects because those are the animals that can safely cross bodies of salt water. Organisms disperse where the environment allows. A small barrier to dispersal could be overcome theoretically easily, but a large barrier could not. This explains why ocean crossings happen so rarely for terrestrial organisms. Both Charles Darwin and Alfred Russell Wallace independently recognized the importance of biogeography as they worked out natural selection. Darwin had his Galapagos animals, and Wallace his Malaysian ones. For our present purposes, we are concerned with the supercontinent Gondwana. As it happens, Wegener's argument that all the continents were pressed together into Pangaea was correct. In fact, there have been multiple supercontinents, such as Rodinia and Panosha. Pangaea existed from about 335 million years ago in the Carboniferous to about 200 million years ago in the Jurassic, and was formed of a northern supercontinent called Laurasia, North America, Europe, and Asia, and Gondwana, South America, Africa, Madagascar, India, Australia, and Antarctica. Gondwana was largely assembled 550 million years ago in the late Ediacaran and began breaking up 180 million years ago in the Jurassic. A little bit after 120 million years ago, Africa and South America completely split. But remember, our common ancestor with Atlantogenata lived 90 million years ago. That means both our common ancestor with Aphrotheria and Xenarthra and the common ancestor of these two superorders lived after the continents had split. However, the continents weren't separated by much. The Atlantic was a very thin sea 90 million years ago, so dispersal from Africa to South America would have been relatively easily. Once the common ancestor of Xenarthrans reached South America, however, the continuing movement of the continents stranded them there. So now, let's meet the mammalian fauna of South America. We'll come back to the marsupials in the next tale, but it appears they dispersed to South America over water from North America. We met the strange Meridiungulata in the hippo's tail. Remember that this clade is most closely related to Perissodactyls, which also originated in North America and includes such members as Toxodon, Macrocinia, and Astrapotherium. But today we're interested in the Xenarthrans who have all been long grouped into a single clade based on extra articulations in their vertebral joints. They all have proportionally large claws, robust spines and pelvises simplified or lacking teeth, and most interestingly, very poor monochromatic vision. These traits are more typically seen in fossorial mammals. For this reason, most research concurs that Xenarthrans descended from subterranean mammals. So the lineages leading to sloths went from below ground to above the ground, to the seas, and to the trees. Ironic for the slowest mammals having made such evolutionary journeys. The first of the Xenarthrans we'll meet are the anteaters. The suborder of anteaters is Vermilingua, meaning worm tongue, because they have a long tongue for 
you guessed it, consuming ants and termites. They've evolved a long, narrow head to aid in this process. Strangely, anteaters walk on their knuckles, and three of the four extant species, the silky anteater, southern tamandua, and northern tamandua, have prehensile tails. The giant anteater, on the other hand, has a large tail like a feather boa. As we've mentioned before, pangolins and aardvarks were previously grouped with xenarthrins into edentata based on their convergent niches before the advent of molecular phylogenetics. However, a few aberrant fossils have been grouped with Xenarthra too, such as Eurotamandua from the Middle Eocene of Europe and Arnanodon from Paleocene China. Molecular clocks paired with tectonic plate data strongly argue for Xenarthrins being isolated from Laurasia, so these fossils being Xenarthrins would require major reworkings of the available data. It's not impossible, just highly unlikely. But a simpler answer based on more complete fossil data has also appeared. Eurotamandua and Arnanodon aren't Xenarthrans, but they are stem pangolins. Eurotamandua is more closely related to crown pangolins than Arnanodon is, the latter being a member of the clade Pelenodonta, which also includes Metachiromes and Xenocranium. Xenocranium is a member of the family Epoicotheriidae, all of whom had highly reduced eyes, upturned snouts, and muscular arms just like moles. It seems the mole niche was independently evolved yet again. Getting back to our Xenarthrans, armadillos are well known for their tough armor, which is ossified dermal tissue, and in the past, some armadillo relatives had clubbed tails too, such as Didacurus. Armadillos are insectivorous, using their large claws for foraging. Some, like the three-banded armadillo, are able to curl into a ball when threatened, but others, like the nine-banded armadillo, cannot. Peltophilus, which lived from 29 to 11.6 million years ago, Oligocene to Middle Miocene, had small horns on its head too. The final group of Xenarthrans is the sloths. Sloths have curved claws that help them lazily hang on to tree branches as they consume leaves, hence their suborder name Folivora. Some prehistoric ground sloths reached massive sizes, such as Megatherium and Glossotherium. Intriguingly, researchers have even found caves carved out by these giant sloths. All of that probably doesn't surprise you. What you may be surprised to know is that sloths can swim. Quite well, in fact. Sloths existed in Cuba, Hispaniola, and Haiti until about 6,000 years ago, meaning they must have crossed open water. Additionally, there was a marine grazing sloth called Thelisocnus that formed a near-perfect transitional sequence from 8 to 1.5 million years ago. As time went on, the lineage developed progressively more aquatic adaptations. Today, though, there are only six extant species of sloth and two genera, the two- and three-toed sloths. Now with South America's fauna in mind, we come to an event that occurred from about 9 to 3 million years ago called the Great American Biotic Interchange. Though the Isthmus of Panama formed about 3 million years ago, island chains were already providing passage for animals to travel between North and South America. Proboscideans, carnivorans, artiodactyls, parasodactyls, and gliars traveled southward, while marsupials, xenarthrans, a handful of notoungulates, and some remnant terror birds like Titanus migrated northwards. The exchange was, however, very one-sided. Far, far more invaders from the north were more ecologically successful than those from the south. While carnivorans, artiodactyls, and perissodactyls underwent various radiations in South America, essentially no South American groups had radiations in North America. And that's the sloth's tail. The positions of the continents are the result of plate tectonics, Xenarthrans reached South America by crossing the thin, nascent Atlantic Ocean, and the connection of North and South America 3 million years ago resulted in their exchange of fauna, leading to the current geographic distributions of New World organisms. In the next tale, we'll meet the marsupials, who will add their own notes on plate tectonics. So, thanks for watching, and we'll see you all next time.